All right. Um, just first off, I'll just say uh, uh, first, I want to mention how uh, sorry I am and was to hear about Brother Dale Strike passing away today. Brother Strike, of course, I believe he was 82. Is that right, Sister Pauline? 84. 84. And yes. I didn't think he was that old. I thought he was in his probably later 70s. I didn't think he's that much older than me, though. But yeah. Anyway, uh, held his age good, and, and he died pretty unexpectedly, I believe, because uh, he did have COVID the second time, uh, but but he but he had a heart attack last night, and that's that really was probably what done him in. And but anyway, um, I'm, we're certainly praying for the family and the church there in Montezuma and all of those that were under Brother Strike's ministry. He was a precious man of God, and the body will certainly miss him. So, um, you've been around a long time. Those of you that may not know down here, you know, he wrote the book on the seven ites, the ites of, of uh, Canaan, and uh, had wrote several, uh, he had several other writings. Uh, I taught here not too long ago about, um, what was that subject? Um, mm, it'll come to me here in a minute ago, but anyway, it was a, a lesson that, um, on iniquity, he taught on iniquity, and he had, uh, he and I had sort of compared notes on that, and that inspired me to talk on it again here recently, and uh, I I got some good things from him about that. Anyway, I just uh, always had a, a good appreciation for Brother Dale Strite, and so we're praying for his family and and the, the church up there and and the saints that uh, were under his ministry. Anyway, not, great he, loss, yes. He, he um, was a great inspiration in our, in our founding of the body of Christ in, the, in our beginnings. He laid a lot of foundation for our assembly. Yes, Brother Goss really thought highly of him and, and uh, he was a great help to Brother Goss, not only in the beginning, but um, you know, throughout his ministry, as he was to many other people. Anyway, um, for those of you that, you know, maybe hadn't been uh, uh, in on our local Bible studies, I, I recently started teaching on the letters to the seven churches in Asia in Revelations 2. And uh, this is, uh, it's really um, something the Lord has put on my heart, I think, and, and also uh, that has come to me of late here. Uh, in fact, I've, I've been wanting to write or put on tape uh, my position or commentary on the book of Revelation chapter, go through each chapter verse by verse. But one of the things that's held me back is these, these letters to the seven churches. And the reason for that is because um, I know and understand that these letters to the seven churches were actual letters written to the seven churches of Asia um, back there in the end of the Jewish world and, and uh, prior to AD 70, I know that a lot of theologians uh, still accept that that was handed down by the Catholic Church that the
Are you on mute, Brother Smith? Okay. Lost your audio, Brother Smith. You're not muted on the video. now yes we can hear you now okay i don't know what happened i i wasn't muted but my 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 microphone evidently wasn't turned on so everybody can hear me now okay just raise your hand if you don't want to turn there you go thank you okay let me let me kind of start all over i was talking about um uh, the fact that here locally I've been going talking on each of the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia. And uh, I've so far I've covered the first two, Ephesus and Smyrna. And tonight I'm going to talk about Pergam Pergamus. But first I want to do a little backdrop to bring people up to date that hasn't heard me talk on it. And I was saying that I haven't, I've, uh, I've had it on my heart to write my position and our commentary on the book of Revelation, going through each chapter verse by verse for some time, because somehow God's dealt with me about this book for, I would say, 25 or 30 years now. It's just came slow and line on line, precept on precept, so to mention or to say. But, but uh, one of the things that's held me back is because I've known that the book of Revelation, for the most part, is to the Gentile world, especially starting with the fourth chapter, where John, after he wrote these seven letters, the angel in the very first verse, uh, he said that I heard a voice like unto a trumpet that said unto me, come up hither and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter, or I'll show you the future. But the first, second, and third chapters we applied back there to the early church prior to its falling away, but it was in a dire condition and falling away rapidly. And so for me to tie in those letters, I was having a hard time figuring out how to tie this in and then jump from what God was dealing with back there in the end of the Jewish world uh, and then jump in the fourth chapter to the future of the Gentiles, Gentile church. But finally, I feel like the Lord finally helped me to understand how to do that. And here's how I've been uh, doing it is these churches, these seven letters that were written back there were written to the seven, I'll say, predominant churches in Asia. There were many more churches in Southeast Asia in Paul's works. Uh, and many of the Jews, at, when they fled prior to AD 70, fled Jerusalem and Israel and went up into Asia, went into many of Paul's works. So those works became not only the Gentile works of Paul, but they became joint assemblies having uh, Jews from the other works of the other apostles that had been martyred. And by the time Paul was martyred, then John actually oversaw those churches while 
Paul was in prison in Rome, Peter, both of Peter's writings, both of his epistles, um, and I can prove it to you in the epistles, that those epistles were written by Peter to Paul's works. Uh, they were written to gen the Gentiles, the Gentile churches. Of course, there, at that time, there was, uh, I'm sure, several of the uh, Jews from the Jewish works in those, in those churches at that time. Uh, but after AD 70, uh, these, the, the falling of the church, falling away of the church was fairly rapid. And, uh, and here, Jesus, never one time in the New Testament had Jesus told any of the apostles to write any letter to any church. But uh, in, in the very first chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, it starts off saying the revelation of Jesus Christ that God uh, gave to him, sent his angel, and he sent his angel to show it unto his servant, John. Look, I'll, I'll screen share here a little bit. Oh, Brother Painter, you'll have to give me the host back for me to screen share. I forgot about that. Um, while he's doing that, I'll go back to the first chapter just so y'all can. There we go. Okay, now, can y'all see? Yeah, there you go. And I'll open this up so you can see it better. Um, so here, see, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. And it looks like that Jesus, after he got to heaven, God didn't just reveal everything to Jesus that wasn't needful for him to talk about while he was here on earth. But after he got back to heaven, God showed him, gave him this, this revelation of the future of the Gentile world. And he sent and showed it to his servant, John. Now, then it says things which must shortly come to pass. I think that's talking about AD 70 that was shortly to come to pass. And then in verse two, it says, who bear the record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that heareth the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. It was time for God to give this revelation to Jesus and Jesus give it to his apostle John so it could be given to the churches. And it started off with, looked like an urgency of seven letters to these seven churches, which still were, had a sevenfold light. The church hadn't fell come away yet. They still had a sevenfold light. And they still had an opportunity to make the bride. But it was like Noah's Ark. The door was soon to shut. Finally, God was to, you know, the, the sevenfold light was going to go out. So it was time for these seven churches to be dealt with in an urgent measure directly from Jesus Christ with a letter that was to be written by John that, that, that Jesus sent his angel to, to um, dictate for him to John to write it. And that's why I'm using that today is because I believe that we're very getting close to a restored church in the end of the Gentile world. I don't think we're near there yet, but I think the time is close. And therefore, the things that were wrong with those churches that God was correcting, I think apply to us in a very great way because we're knocking on the door of uh, going back into a restored church. And so we're going to have to correct some of the things that they had to correct that was causing them to fall away. And we're going to have to correct some of those things 
prior to us getting back into uh, a sevenfold light or a, a restored church condition. And let me say something about the restored church. I don't know what everyone's thought or thinking is about a restored church. But if you're thinking the restored church is going to be a glorious, you know, perfect church, you're wrong. And you're, you're, miss, you're, miss, you're missing it. Because a restored church is going to be a lot of problems. And here's why. is because we're going to have a, 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 just a great number of God's children from Babylon come into the body. And just like the early church, if you go back and read the New Testament epistles and the, and the history of the book of Acts, you're going to see that church though it was had a sevenfold light, it, it was plagued with trouble, problems of the flesh, all kinds of problems of the flesh. And, and the reason being is because people were coming into the body of Christ, and there were many people on different levels. There was a lot of operations of the flesh until God was able to get control of that. And uh, through the teaching of the truth of the word of God and through the authority and um, of the word of God through his ministry, the judgment. It was a good judgment that would, you know, we've all, we've, um, I've always followed what Brother Linegar taught on judgment being informative or instructive. That's how God judges you. He gives you instruction and information. It's not a judgment where he's coming to, to punish you because of what you've done wrong. No, first he gives you information in instruction, and then he gives you correction. If you can't take the instruction that will help you escape correction, you, you, you may have to go through some corrective measures. Um, and God's very gracious and very tender about being having a hard corrective hand uh, especially on those that don't have a, the understanding he first wants you to get the understanding and then there is chastising judgment god will not only correct you uh with the word of god you know less like a little child you, you first give a little child instruction. And if they don't heed your instruction, you, you, you give them correction, but it's a lighter correction than possibly a, a spanking or, you know. But finally, if they don't heed the correction, you may have to get have a stronger correction. It may, may take a, a rod, uh, you know, of correction, of, of chastisement. And that's how God does. And so <clears throat> finally, God's judgment becomes eternal. In other words, you, you, you finally grow to a place in God where you will, his eternal judgment will be applied, applied to you. Where, like for an example, the, uh, da, uh, Adam, Adam was in a place in the garden that was such a high place in his understanding that when he disobeyed God, he was eternally judged for it. But God doesn't eternally judge anybody until, until they're worthy of that kind of judgment. In other words, God, and that doesn't mean the first time you hear something that you may get it, it still may take time for you to be able to digest it and really have it as part of your understanding. So, <clears throat> Uh, these going back to these 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 letters to these seven churches, God was trying to get these churches to come up with it. Let me let me say a little bit more about the restored church. Um, there's going to be people of all different levels in the, even in the restored church because. So just because the church is restored doesn't mean 
you know, it's going to be easy to make the bride. No, you're still going to go through the process of judgment. You'll have to go through God's judgment and God will have to help you grow and develop until finally you gain a full understanding and a full wisdom of God to where you're able to live above sin. And finally, you've put off the flesh. Uh, so for an example, there may be, in other words, you'll have to grow to a place where you can discern what's righteous and what's not righteous. What's, it, what's in God's order and what's not in God's order. And there's, there's going to be an array of works of the flesh that you have to weed your way through. God will have to help you to get to a place that you've developed to where you're heeding to truth and, and true order of God uh, and growing into, into that place. So let's see here, right here on this little map, let me pull it out here. Now, see, can everybody see this map okay? Okay, here's the, right here is, oh, I'm sorry, here's Greece, of course. Over oh, here's Italy and Rome. Uh, but right here's the E, G, and C. And here is Asia, Southeast Asia, right in here, which here's some of the churches. Here's Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamon, uh, over here's Philadelphia, Sardis, and Laodicea. There's your seven churches. And as you can see, these churches were just off uh, Pergamon here. The church at uh, Pergamos was, that's about 20 miles off of the sea. Uh, Ephesus and Smyrna, they, they were very close to this Aegean Sea. Right here, uh, Right here is the Isle of Patmos, this little island. Right here is where John was. And by the way, that was a very uh, well-inhabited island. I used to think the island of Patmos was just, you know, just a bare island. He was just out there by himself. I don't know where I got that. But after doing enough research, I realized this was a, a, a great and in well-inhabited island. It looks very small, I know, but... Uh, it was bigger than, than, than what it looks like on a map on here. And the law of Rome was this, is uh, when a dictator like uh, Caesar, uh, when one of the Caesars exiled someone, and the reason that Nero exiled John was to shut him up where he couldn't preach the gospel all over Rome and all over Asia and all over that that Rome ruled. And the ruling was in Rome, or the law was, is as long as you remained where you were exiled, you could live there and go about your business. But if you left there, you would be murdered. You would you'd be worthy of death, and Rome would have you sentence you to death. And so John was on Patmos, I would say, until he got this revelation, until he wrote this book. But prior to AD 70, he went back to Ephesians, Ephesus, where he later died. He spent his last years, according to traditional history, John died at Ephesus. So he was freed, and, he, and here's how he got freed. The, the rulers or Caesars, once they died, anyone that was exiled by them was set free. Now, the next Caesar could put them back in exile somewhere, but they were freed once the, 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 the Caesar of Rome that put them in exile died, they were freed. That's why I think John was, he was freed prior to AD 70, went back to Ephesus and died there. And, um, uh, of uh, course, uh, but he wrote this. He wrote this letter to there at Patmos, the Revelation. And so, let me mention this about these seven churches. They didn't just get the letter to them. 
those letters were part of the writing of the book of Revelation. They all were able to read one another's letters, and everybody else in Asia was able to read them. I believe that those seven messages that were written to those seven churches applied to everyone in all the churches in the body of Christ. It just, God picked out the prominent churches, which were probably mother churches to other works. And, uh, but all of these people had all of these things. There is some, a little, all of it was probably uh, works of the flesh that was in those churches. It had to be overcome for those churches to maintain a sevenfold light and for those people to still have an opportunity for making the bride of Christ. Okay, let me, I'll move this back a little bit out of the way so we can see the word of God a little better. So, uh, so I'm just saying the time that was at hand, it was time for God to give this revelation. And it was time, the time was short for before the church fell away. And uh, so he's giving explicit instruction before the falling away of the church to these seven churches, which went, it went to all the churches actually. And I believe that most of the book of Revelation symbols, it's, it's a symbolic book because it's written in prophecy. You might wonder, why does God write things so difficult to understand sometimes, especially if it's a parable or a prophecy? Well, if God didn't do that, then the enemy, the adversary of God, would know what he was doing and could hinder what God's works are. And so he reveals it to babes, <laughs> uh, Paul said, but... Uh, he blinds the eyes of the of the wise. You know, it's not there's not very many wise called, and so God reveals this to the wise. I mean, to the babes. So here he's writing these letters to the seven churches, and I'll and you know I understand that you're some people think, well, what in the world do I need to understand about these seven churches are way back there. Well, number one, it's the word of God. Number two, it has application to where we're living today because these churches were falling away. We're in a fallen condition, but we're close to overcoming. And no doubt, everything that these churches had as a problem applies to us today because we're in a very similar place that they were in or nearing that place. And so I think it's important to understand why, what God was correcting in these churches. And I won't go over too much of this uh, because I've already been over it. Um, but uh, Ephesus, um, you know, uh, it was a very predominant city of the seven churches. And of course, look, uh, these churches had a sevenfold light. Oh, those, if you, if you back up right here to this 20th verse of chapter one, it says, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels. That word angels simply means a pastor or a messenger. Uh, he was writing these letters to the bishop of those churches, those who are in charge of the churches, and uh, the seven candlesticks, which I saw are the seven churches. Those were churches that had a sevenfold light. In other words, they had, there wasn't anything that God had not revealed to them. And so those churches had that. Well, um, so in Ephesus, he's telling them, I know your works, your labor, your patience, uh, how you can't bear them that are evil. And you tried them that say they're apostles and are not and found them to be liars. I'll just quickly mention, if you remember Paul in the Acts, the 20th chapter, his last visit with the elders in Ephesus, 
he told them, he said, after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, spoiling the flock. Men of your own selves rising up. He, in other words, he prophesied that to them. And no doubt, some of these men right here, or some of these right here in Ephesus were probably some of those men that were declaring themselves to be apostles, but they were not. But this church had the discernment to know that these men were false. They were false men of God. Uh, they, they may have started out being men of God, but they were false. They found them to be liars. Uh, you know, you can, you can lose your calling in God or you can miss it. And, um, but then anyway, he told them, you felt you left, you left your first love. And he tells them, if you don't repent and go do your first works over, I'm going to come quickly and remove your candlestick. Um, well, I think that's your first love is when you first are saved, you meet salvation, you're born again of the Holy Ghost, you, you love your Savior, uh, you, you de start developing an intimate relationship with him. And I've told the church here, it's easy, you know, it's very essential that you learn uh, the mechanics of the body of Christ. And uh, what I'm, what I'm referring to as mechanics is that, uh, uh, the, the doctrine for one order for another one standards for another one. When I'm saying standards, I'm not just talking about dress standards. I'm talking about behavioral standards, standards for living, you know, moral standards. Um, and, uh, but God has an order. He's got a ministry that God works through. You still have to learn how to discern what the right ministry is. What's the righteous ministry? Who are truly elders in the body? Not men. We'll have men in here. We do now that think they're apostles and they're not. We got men that think they have authority, but they don't. <clears throat> uh, you're always going to have that. You're going to have men in the flesh, some that are exalted, some that are not, of course. <clears throat> this, uh, but but you can get out of focus. You can make doctrine your God. You can make order your God. You can make standards your God. I know people that have such a holiness standard that they're almost worthless. They're so proud of their standard and they hold themselves up higher than everybody else. They equate righteousness to a holiness standard, a dress standard. I got news for you. That won't make you, you won't make it. That's not the answer. Should, should we dress like a Christian? Should we be moderate in our behavior and our attitude? Sure, we should. Should we have good morals? Sure, we should. Should we ought to be righteous in everything that we do? But when you start lifting up one thing higher than Christ, he's no longer on the front, front burner. You got out of focus and you put Christ in, uh, in on the back burner and you made doctrine. You know, some men love doctrine more than they love the spirit of God. The spirit, and I'm not talking about the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the righteous spirit. Uh, you, you can't love doctrine uh, above Christ and above the, your intimacy or your relationship with Christ. Doctrine something that you'll grow as you, and that's teaching or, and that's understanding. Uh, but what I'm telling you is you can get out of balance. All these, those mechanics are absolutely essential, but they're not, you're not to get those mechanics so out of focus that you put them above your walk with God. You got to keep that first love. And then he says, uh, one thing you have is you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I'm just going to quickly say the, Nicol the word Nicolaitan means to conquer the people. That's just simply dictators that are leaders, men that are dictatorial. 
they're so afraid of losing authority that they they use fear to keep everybody under their thumb. And no one can ever grow but just so high. And God hates that. God hates that, that men, true ministers of God are to be are to be developing people, never keeping them under their thumb, but developing them where they finally have a relationship with Christ that they don't need that ministry anymore. They're righteous. They don't need, they don't need to ask, you know, uh, what to do or what not to do or get counsel about certain things because they've grown to a place that they know the answer. They know what's righteous and what the order of God is. How are you going to work directly under Christ and rule and reign with him for a thousand years if you don't grow to that place? And if a minister don't help to help you develop there, but there's men that are dictators. You got to discern that in the body of Christ. Um, that's what that word Nicolaitans means. Um, uh, what was the, that was one of the things that he hated. And, 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 but he says then to him that old cometh, I'll get to eat of the tree of life, which is amidst the paradise of God. So he's still giving them a promise of overcoming and making the bride of Christ. Okay, in the church of Smyrna, I'll just quickly, he knows their works, their tribulation, their poverty, but he says, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews and are not, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. The word Satan means adversary. In other words, the Jews had become an adversary to the body of Christ, probably more than, than Rome, the Romans. I don't think the Romans understood it altogether, but no doubt there were different secular groups of the Jews, and there was Herodians, and there were several Romans that were involved in those religions back there. But those that say they were Jews, but are not, you know, in other words, they declared to be Jews because they were born of the seed of Abraham, maybe circumcised of the flesh or the, the men were, but <laughs> they weren't circumcised of the heart by the Holy Ghost. Uh, what does he say? Uh, the devil's going to cast some of you in prison. Uh, for 10 days, that that's just represents a short period of time. But be faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. So one of the things you, you ought to notice here, he's not going to get in the way and prevent them from being martyred. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. See, sometimes we think God just ought to remove everything from us. But he don't do that, not always. God, God lets us go through suffering. He lets us, he lets different ones go through death. When you read Paul's writings, you know, wasn't it, who was it? Was it um, Onesimus that was death, sick nigh unto death? <laughs> you know, uh, they couldn't heal him. They couldn't, those, the apostle Paul couldn't put his hands on him and heal him. God put him through a suffering for a purpose, no doubt. I'm not saying God didn't do it. God did. But I'm just saying sometimes we have to accept God's will above our will. We have to realize God doesn't just remove everything from everybody. <clears throat> it's like this pandemic right now. God is not removing this from the body of Christ. There's people getting it. There's people dying. It's Ministers of God, good saints of God, have died with this pandemic, and people still getting it. You know, I just got over it. Thank God I, I survived it. You know, I'm still suffering repercussions from it. I'm still very, I'm still have a tremendous amount of, of fatigue in my stomach. I have my, my I've, I've been sort of plagued with the upset stomach ever since I've had it, and I hadn't completely got rid of it. I told my wife, today's the best day I've had since I got COVID. Um, I, my stomach is much better today, and I'm thankful for that. Okay, so, uh, so that takes us down to, and I've, I've talked on the, 
Ephesus and, per, and Smyrna here in the local church. But here, the church at Pergamos, I'll say something about it tonight. Um, well, Pergamos, I won't read everything to you here. I've got a note on it. It was a it was a prominent church in Mysia, the province of North, Northwest Asia Minor, um, located about three miles off the river of Caicos and 20 miles from the sea. That's the Aegean Sea. Um, let's see what else. Okay, though in existence by at least 500 BC, Pergamos was not well known until two center, centuries later when Lysimachus, a successor to Alexander the Great, chose to store his treasure in the city. He entrusted, this is a little bit interesting, he entrusted uh, Philatius, his garrison commander, with his treasure of 9,000 talents. In 283 BC, Philatius betrayed Lysimachus to Seleucus, uh, uh, the first when the latter was attacking Lysimachus, Philateus, Terus, then appropriated the money and the city became a vassal under the Seleucids. So he entrusted him, but it did, his trust didn't go that far because he betrayed him. Under the successors of Philatius, uh, the small kingdom became independent. It retained this independence with help of the Romans until 133 BC when last king of Pergamos bequeathed the vast treasure of the kingdom to the Romans. And the Romans de uh, declared, claimed the entire kingdom, not just the treasure that had been bequeathed. They vanquished the last of the king's line and established the kingdom as the province of Asia. Pegamus was famous for its literary character and idolatry since the Egyptians who controlled the production of papyrus would not give Pergamus the paper to build a rival library. The people of Pergamus perfected the art of preparing animal skins for writing. Our word parchment is derived from the Latin pergamia, pergamina, pergamus. In other words, that's where we got the word parchment from. Pergamus had a vast library, 200,000 volumes, rolls, rivaling that at Alexandria. Unfortunately, Anthony and Tony presented his, this library, which did not belong to him, to Cleopatra after the library moved to Egypt. It and the Alexandrian library were destroyed by Caliph Omar. That was the Muhammad's later. The city had a cluster of famous temples dedicated to Zeus, Minerva, Apollo, Venus, Bacchus, and Asclepius. One of the seven churches of Asia Minor was at Pergamus, where Satan's seat was. Anyway, so uh, that's just a little bit of historical background on the city itself. But to the church, what is he actually saying here? He that has a sharp sword, the two edges. You know, we've always taught the word of God is a sharp, is a sword, and it's got two edges. It, the same person that's using it to judge by has got a sword facing them too. So it judges both ways. I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. In other words, that city had a lot of idolatry, uh, worshipers of other gods. I mentioned Apollos, uh, Zeus, many of these other gods. Um, but he said, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an Antimus was my faithful martyr who was slain among, the, among you where Satan dwelleth. Antipas his fate, the Martin, martyr, if you study the history on that, it's really something how he was martyred. He was actually placed in a copper pig, a big copper pig, 
Antipas was placed in that, that pig was held over a fire until it became just flaming red and cooked him inside that pig. That's, that's, that's one of the most horrible um, stories about martyrdom that I've ever heard. Anyway, that's what it says. But it said, I have a few things. And, and look, that was a faithful witness of God. And God let him go through that. Of course, we don't know. You know, I mean, God may have, he may not have felt hardly nothing. God may, have, you know, but he took him in that pig before he cooked. I don't know. But the point is, God did not deliver him out of that particular uh, instance. Um, but then he says, uh, I've got a few things against thee. Thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before Israel. Children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Number one, let me say this about Balaam. He was very, uh, what's the word I want? Um, he was a hypocrite. <laughs> Everything Balaam did was for Balaam. He was out for himself. He wasn't out. This represents uh, leaders, people in ministry, and other probably others that had influence in the church that were... You know, they were in this for themselves. Somebody's microphone's on. I don't know who it is. So you might check your mic and mute it if you can hear yourself scratching around. Um, all right, but he had taught Balak. See, he couldn't curse Israel. So he taught Balak how to cast a stumbling block on the children of Israel. Deep things sacrificed to idols. Okay, let's stop a minute. Would everyone check your microphone? Someone is making noise and your microphone is on. Look at your little mic. And if you just touch your picture, click the mute button there. Oh, now I'm asking you, I didn't mean to click on unmute. You're fine. Here, Brother Durham, you need to mute. Uh, I don't know who else might have it. But anyway, okay. Um, okay, let me get back to the doctrine of Balaam. Okay, to eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, I don't think that a seven, I don't think a sevenfold, a church that had a sevenfold light, I doubt seriously that there were anybody literally eating things offered to idols. But, you got to get you got to get that Old Testament shadow of that what that really refers to, and it refers to in in take uh, uh, receiving things into your life that makes the flesh feel good, or things that you idolize, you, things that you really love that that pleases the flesh, uh, God hates that. And God does not want us to, uh, and, it, and it also could have to do with false doctrine. It could have to do with anything, anything that you make into an idol and you worship that above, of, above the real truth of the word of God and, and the righteousness of Christ. And then to commit fornication, that, that even is a type of fornication when, when you may be receiving doctrine. You know, fornication is when you, you're not true to Christ. You know, we're called virgins, virgin churches. Um, but, but when we intertwine things of this world, our doctrines of men, ideologies of ourselves. You can do that. I've noticed, I've had people in my ministry that, that I've watched them. And I've seen that somewhere along the line, they stopped. You know, they, they stopped pressing forward to receiving the 
unadulterated truth of God's word, and they just started idolizing their own ideology of thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know if I believe all this. I don't know if I have to go through all this overcoming to make it. I'm just going to serve God and do the best I can do. Well, those people have lost touch with the truth of God's word and the thing that God's leading us in to understand. Um, in other words, you, you can stop. You can, you know, the children of Israel stopped on, some of them wanted to stop on, on this side of Jordan. They didn't want to go on into the, the, the promised land. Because when they got up to Jordan, it was a beautiful, it, both sides of Jordan, you know, there's a valley, is luscious and grasses for their cattle. And, and uh, it was a beautiful place, either side. Uh, and uh, some of them didn't want to go. They didn't want to go into Canaan and fight and, be, and have to take the ites of the land. Uh, they were satisfied with where God had brought them. And you can get that way spiritually. You can get to a place where God's blessed you to a point that, you know, you may get to a place you don't want to, you don't want to fight a fight. You don't want to withstand the wiles of the devil. You know, God, and, and God will bless you. You know, if you've been faithful to God, uh, we've always said it's like putting money in the bank. It's like building grace in heaven. And God will let you, he'll let you uh, withdraw out of your grace account in heaven. You know, God, God will, he's not going to owe you anything. If he owes you for being faithful to him, he will repay you. He'll, he'll bear with you. That doesn't mean you'll make it. But anyway, <clears throat> so I would relate to this uh, this doctrine of Balaam as not being literally worshiping idols or eating uh, that that's been offered to them or committing natural fornication. I think that's talking about spiritual fornication and spiritual partaking of things of the flesh you know, that, that it is hindering the, the spirit of Christ in your life. He's telling them, then in verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. He, he, he mentioned that in the letter to Ephesus. The same problem was there. There was men there. And, and that's prominent in, in authority. <clears throat> Every man had to learn that God raises up in the ministry that has a gift that it puts them in authority you, you have to learn that you cannot dictate to God's people. Now, I will say this. That there's people, there's little children, there's babes in Christ. There's, you can't treat everybody the same. There's some children in the body of Christ that you have to, you have to uh, give them instruction. You have to give them orders, more or less. Uh, is they're like children. You have got to, to help them. But as they grow, you got to begin to take restrictions off of them. Let them become adults. Let them gr grow and develop. And you can't keep them little children forever. And, and then there's men that are dictators that one of the reasons they're dictators is because they're they're fearful of losing authority. And that tells me they don't really have any. When a man has to demand, it, when he has to enforce authority upon all of God's people, keep them all under his thumb, he don't ever give them room to grow. That tells me that man doesn't only doesn't really have true authority, he's afraid of losing it. And that's why he uses fear tactics. That's what caused him to become a dictator. And it, it takes wisdom of God helping a ministry to develop to a place that they have enough wisdom to operate without uh, being a dictator or a Nicolaitan, so to speak. So that was a prominent problem in these churches back there. Um, 
he said, repent, verse 16, or else I'll come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, God will, he'll take the word of God and judge them if they don't heed to this correction he's given them. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saying to the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna. That hidden manna, of course, is, is the word of God that it, it will take a revelation and help from God for you to be able to get all of the wisdom of God, uh, of the word of God, and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that received it. I had a man, a minister, call me this week and told me, he said, Brother Leninger, said, I had a vision where Brother Leninger gave me a white stone. I had a vision where Brother Leninger physically, in this vision, walked up to me and had his hand out to me, and I reached my hand out, and he placed a white stone in my hand. He said, I don't have a clue what that meant. I said, you don't? He said, no. I said, well, let me tell you what it means. I said, it means that Brother Leninger had the word of God that he could give you that would cause you to receive a white stone or you could make the bride of Christ. Brother Leninger had, had words of, of righteous words of truth that would help you to, to accomplish that. But he said, but here he's saying, uh, in that stone was a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receiveth it. Let me give you a couple of scriptures on that. Here's one in Isaiah 62, 2. Can, are y'all able to see that? Yes, we're able to yes, see we're it. Able. Yes. All right. So here it says, and the Gentiles shall see the righteousness See thy righteousness and all the, all kings thy glory. Thou shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So there's, there's a prophecy from Isaiah showing that the Gentiles would get this new name. But then also, I'll give you this other scripture in Revelations 19, 12, where <clears throat> it's talking about Jesus riding on a, on a white horse. Let me back up here just a little bit. It said, I saw in heaven open to behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the dipture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Strange. He was given a name that nobody knew but him, but here's what the name was, the word of God. <laughs> you still don't know what that is unless you really know what Christ knew. And it's the same way when you receive a white stone where it is a name that no man knows save he that gets it. I've said this a lot. I've used that scripture in 12th chapter of Revelation saying it. Those Old Testament saints, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And I've said this over and over. Nobody has your testimony. Only you have it. I don't care if you're an identical twin with somebody. They don't have your testimony. Nobody has your testimony. Nobody has your fingerprint or the iris of your eye. You are an individual and things have happened to you in this life that's happened to nobody but you, not in the same way that it's happened to you. And you, that's your testimony and you have to respond to God and everything, every deed, everything about that takes place in your life, God's going to judge. God's going to deal with it. And that's your testimony. And you overcome by the word of your testimony. You're going to overcome the, the things that you encounter in life that God takes you through and helps you to find righteousness in every situation that you face. And 
that's that new name that nobody knows but him that see that receives it. You're the only one in the bride of Christ. If you make the bride of Christ, you're the only one that has your testimony, that has your place in God's body. We're all as great as God is. He made every one of us individuals. He's that great. He's that able. Anyway, uh, I hope I'm saying something in these churches to help you know something about what was written here, why it was written, but also how it applies to us, how we can apply it to our life, and how we can realize what some of these spirits were, some of these adversaries that these people dealt with right before the church fell away, and that was things that were hindering them uh, because many of the righteous leadership had passed off the scene and there wasn't anyone there to hold this in these churches. And it was in, infiltrating these churches. And we've got the infiltrated, of, you know, I mean, you could say where you live. I don't care who you are, where you're at. Satan's seat is there. The adversary to God is working in the area you live in, the city you live in. It's that strong sin and corruption strong in this world. But the greater the restoration of the church is, history shows that there was 2,000 saints in Pergamos. Think about that. In that city, with all that evil going on and the church falling away, there were still 2,000 saints in that church. We've got a ways to go, don't we? Does anybody know about a church in the body that's got 2,000 saints in it? Well, you will if you live long enough and see a restored church. You're going to see churches that have great numbers of God's people in them. Cities, you know, we may have to, you know, we, it may be a city like Pergamus. You don't know. They may have had several different pastors. They may have several churches. Uh, that had church house to house. They may not have had a large building, but that city had 2,000 saints in it, according to traditional history of the body of Christ that I've studied about anyway. Anyhow, um, before we close tonight, would y'all like to uh, mention some prayer requests? Let's everybody turn on your microphone. Let's pray together. Remember, Brother uh, Fisher, he's over COVID. He's doing good, but his little girl Bridget's got it. She's doing good, but she's not over it yet. Um, remember Brother Dale Strikes family is the church there in Montezuma, Montana. Thanks there. And maybe some more of y'all would like to mention some prayer requests. Sister Durham, I know her mother is uh, she's really getting up in age uh, and um, she's not doing well or, and health wise and she needs some prayers. Like I think Sister Brown is going to speak in or to check on her and see what she can do to help out. What else? All right, let's let's pray for uh, the works over in the Dominican Republic and Mexico. I'm trying to work for those people, and help them, and so let's keep them in our prayers. They they certainly do need our prayers. They, of course, they have this pandemic going on over there. And, uh, we haven't lost. I don't. I can't. There's not anybody in in the Dominican Republic and any of the body churches that has died with COVID, but we've had several have it. Uh, Brother Elias Ciprian and Brother Rio Green just got over it. Um, uh, and then uh, they, they, some of Brother Hugo Rodriguez's people in Mexico down there have had it. So we need to keep them in our prayers because they don't have the medical uh, means either. Also, Brother Goss, let's keep Brother Goss in our prayers. And guess what, Canada, he certainly 
uh, is still, you know, he's up in age and he's, he's, his health's not, uh, we're, you know, he's not doing well health-wise. So let's keep the church there in Keswick in our prayers and, and Brother Goss and his family. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. God, for your Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. 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 Oh, concerning your work. I will be done. Praise God. Praise God. Bless you. Our assembly here, oh, give you praise. We're thankful for your goodness. Oh, bless it, the great word of God. Yeah, thank you, Lord, that you've oh, your praise, word. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank, thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, All right. God bless everyone. Hope that you have a great weekend. Uh, Forward to the weekend here in the Little Rock Church. Jesus, Jesus. We, we had the smallest crowd last weekend that we've had since I've been here for the last 14 years because we had so many out with COVID and people that have been exposed and people that were, you know, they heard that we had several in our church that had COVID, they, they wouldn't come they were afraid and you know i said oh lord there's covid in the church we better not go we had a small crowd but we still had a good service and appreciated the lord for being with us on that but this weekend most of them will be back but uh, anyway uh y'all pray for us and we'll pray for you god bless your hearts have a good night good night god bless you brother okay night. god bless talk to you later Bye-bye. Uh, by the way, I did record this message, and anybody wants it, if you want to just text me, I'll send you the recording of this uh, Bible study tonight. God bless you all. Have a good night. Good night. Okay. Alrighty. I don't know if I stopped recording, did I? There we go.